I am Ben Kramer. I'm a tax attorney with Kramer Legal LLC, a firm that I formed almost exactly seven years ago. Seven years ago in about a month or so. I've been practicing for 12 years and I actually started off uh, working for the federal courts, uh, one of which primarily hears tax disputes. So I backed into tax law from the perspective of working with a federal judge to resolve cases where, by definition, everything I do now didn't work because the client is in federal court. So you know, we try to keep that from happening. We're trying to keep that from happening to any of you. So I want to talk through today is uh, what to do if you find yourself in tax trouble. Most of my practice consists of either working with individuals and business owners to avoid tax problems, or, to be honest, more often than not, my first encounter with a client is they've, they're have they getting love letters from the IRS all of a sudden, and we need to figure that out. Does anybody want to admit to being on the receiving end of those? <laughs> wow, okay, you're actually admitting that. Usually, I know people are, and particularly you, whose name I'm not going to mention because there's a camera running. See, I'm being, I'm being polite here. Vanessa, I'll talk about. Uh, uh, so I have been too. Uh, and if you haven't, you likely will, particularly if you own a business. Every, every year, I get two letters from the IRS. I haven't received mine yet this year, but I know it's coming. Uh, the first one accusing me of being a terrible person because I didn't file a payroll tax return from a time period where I had no employees which is actually a decent reason for not filing an employee's tax return. Uh, and two, uh, about a week later, I get a letter questioning whether it, I'm fit to practice before the US Treasury because I'm a bum who doesn't file payroll tax returns. So every year, I send in a copy of last year's letter where they said, we've investigated this and everything's fine. And they don't seem to get the humor in any of this. But I fully expect this will, this will continue. The problem, though, is they were asking for something like $800. They make millions of dollars a year off of someone saying, oh my goodness, I owe the IRS money. Here, take it. So I try to uh, warn clients that you know, just because you get the bill doesn't mean you actually owe it. Uh, you'd be amazed how often mistakes are made here. And there's, you know, there's millions and millions of accounts they're dealing with. But uh, that's what we're going to talk through today. So if you guys want to throw in your own issues, I am glad to talk through any of that. There's not a large crowd here. I would rather take this in the direction that's helpful to you guys rather than just, just pontificate here. But uh, I'm going to get started and just interrupt me if I can answer anything specific. So with my, uh, my required notice here, this theoretically is attorney advertising and you can't, shouldn't rely on it for legal advice or tax advice, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this is not legal advice about your specific situation. This may not even be good tax advice because I don't know your facts. Uh, if this raises issues that hit a chord with you, I strongly recommend you talk to a tax advisor about it if you don't have one. If we have time at the end, uh, I can talk through how to go about picking one. Uh, you know, this time of year, we're all bombarded with advertisements. Uh, a lot of these guys are better at marketing, unfortunately, than they are at taxes. But uh, we'll talk through, talk through that. So here's what I, I really want to talk about as kind of a, a preview of today's, today's discussion. We're going to talk about how the IRS goes about making that tax bill. You know, where, where does it come from? We'll talk about the actual collections process. We're going to talk about tools to solve tax problems. And then as proof that I am better at taxes than PowerPoint, I actually mentioned twice, apparently, that we will uh, talk about how to select a tax professional if, uh, if we have time at, at the end here. Kind of already talked a little bit about myself and what, what I do. Sometimes we get the question of why is an attorney talking to us about taxes? Now, I, am, I am not a CPA, so I feel like I have to give that disclaimer too. I regularly tell clients there are two types of tax professionals out there. There are those that love spreadsheets, love numbers, love sort of connecting the dots and weaving through tax loopholes. Those strange, strange people become accountants. I just like sticking it to the government, so I'm an attorney. That's our, uh, our difference here. Uh, but having said that, you know, accountants are our best partners. We work, we work every day with, with different uh, CPAs, and I can point you in the right direction. But let's talk about how the IRS goes about actually making a bill saying, you here's what you owe. Something is messed up with my fonts here. See, I just continue to, to please on, um, 
on this. I'll send a, a, a PDF copy of this. You can just uh, contact Vanessa if you want a copy that has fonts that aren't uh, doing whatever this thing is doing. I didn't do that at home. That's really weird. So uh, you'll frequently hear, uh, if you Google this, you'll see all sorts of, uh, if you want to be entertained, you'll see some entertaining uh, comments out there, that our, our system of taxation is voluntary. It's based on voluntary assessment. In case anyone had the idea that that means it's optional, let me give the advice here, it is not. Uh, voluntary does not mean optional. If you believe it is optional, you will get more letters from the IRS and need eventually need a different type of attorney than, than me. By voluntary, what they mean is there are some systems, there are certain countries in Europe, for example, where you don't have to pay income taxes, they just straight take it out of your paycheck. Uh, they'll take care of all the processing on, on their end. Here, our system's more complicated. We have you know, your, your employer is going to withhold income tax from you, but they don't know how many kids you have. They don't know what your mortgage situation is. So we end up having to file a tax return to disclose to the government what, what we're allowed to keep, what we're allowed to, to deduct. And that's the voluntary part. The voluntary in this context just means the government's not doing it for you. So the catch here is there has to be an assessment before the IRS can send a bill. So an assessment is just the legal determination that you owe this tax. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to talk about income taxes. In case any, if anyone has questions about you know, payroll tax, sales tax, other issues, we, we can talk about that. Uh, but income tax is what most of us are dealing with, particularly this time of year. So I'm going to focus mainly on how we go about assessing an income tax bill. The income tax bill becomes payable on December 31st of any given year. So this past December 31st, legally, you owed, you begin to owe, what you accumulated in taxes for 2017. It's not due yet. You know, it's not due until April 15th. And the weird part of our, our tax system here is the government doesn't know how much is due yet, and you probably don't either, until you complete a tax return. So in the normal course of business, the way we generate the tax bill is we tell the government what it is by filling out the tax return and sending it in. So if that tax return says you owe $1,000, then there you go. The IRS is going to generate a bill saying that you owe $1,000. And then we have a whole system of audits and other, other verifications to make sure that you know, people were, were being honest, people didn't leave things off, and that happens all the time. Our system is complicated enough that uh, if people make mistakes, and most of these aren't, aren't criminal. But let's, um, let's talk through what, you know, what happens when you don't send that in. And this is a, a frequent issue we see is someone doing their taxes and realizes, oh no, I'm going to owe whatever, $5,000. I know, I'm just not going to send in the return. That's horrible, horrible advice. So if you get nothing else out of this, please know that it will always be in your benefit to file the tax return. If you're going to owe a lot of money, I promise you the government knows that and will figure that out, but it will be far cheaper if you're the one that tells them. So what happens when you don't file a return uh, depends on a number of factors. One of them is whether you're even required to file. I mean, if you're unemployed, you have no income, no assets, you may not have a, a filing requirement whatsoever. If you're, if you're retired, depending on what sort of income you have coming in, if it's all Social Security and it's below the taxable threshold, you may not have a filing requirement. For um, the fun of it, we threw out, this is the, the table where if you make below this amount, you're not required to file a tax return for 2016. This actually will, this is, so you can go ahead and raise this a couple hundred dollars for 2017, but it's the same, same concept. If you're making 10,000 a year, you don't have to file a tax return if you're uh, in any of these categories. You probably still want to file a tax return. So, for example, we, we regularly get the client who has a, you know, a kid who worked at Kings Island for the summer. You know, they may have made $5,000 for the whole year. Well, file a tax return because they're withholding taxes from that that the kid's going to get back. So most people who are you know, up against these limits will benefit, if any of that's from employment, by filing the return because you get, you get money back. You don't get money back if you don't file the return. Does it make sense so far? Okay, so I'm going to have to try harder. If a tax presentation makes sense, then something's, something's gone wrong. 
here's what you're up against eventually if you don't file a return. When I said I promise the IRS knows, the way they know is when someone gives you a W-2, they give a copy to the IRS. And they give you a 1099, they give a copy to the IRS. And the IRS has a computer system that uses these matching algorithms to figure out that if you filed a tax return and for some reason you didn't report the $16 in dividend income you made from that stock that grandma gave you that you totally forgot about, I'm speaking from personal experience here from a couple years ago, they will catch that. Uh, they'll catch that and they'll send you a notice saying, uh, we noticed that you forgot to include this document, uh, this income document. They don't care if you leave off deductions. Uh, but if there was income reported, uh, th they will eventually figure that out and wonder why you didn't report it. And since the IRS is nice about these things, they'll even do the math for you uh, and uh, tell you what the penalty and interest will be for not reporting that and then allow you to just, just sign off. So if this happens repeatedly or if this involves a large sum of money, the IRS will eventually create what it calls a substitute for return. Or you'll hear these called SFRs, same, same thing, SFR, substitute for return. The idea is, remember, the IRS can't collect until there's an assessment. If you didn't create the assessment yourself by filing a tax return, it has to figure out how to assess you without a return. So what it will do is it'll use whatever information it has on file. So if it has a copy of your W-2, or if it has that 1099, it's going to use those. It's going to use those and create a return with no deductions. They'll file you a single, no exemptions. So it's a worst case tax return. If you're a business, does anybody here own a, own a business? Okay. If you're a business, it gets worse because uh, they may not stop there. So if you're a business that, um, if you're a lawn care business, for example, the IRS may decide, well, what does the average lawn care company in Southwest Ohio make each year? <laughs> because if you're representing your residential customers, they're not going to give you a 1099. So the IRS knows it doesn't have the information to make that determination, so it'll take averages. And of course, they're always very optimistic about your abilities once they, when they're estimating how much money you made. So it's not uncommon to get, to get this tax bill in the mail for, we've seen plenty of cases where the IRS says someone owes more in taxes than they ever made that year because they're using these statistical averages. Th this is a wake up call. So th the point here is for the IRS, the IRS now has your attention because they've been sending a bill. But the problem is in their system, there's now a tax return on file. You know, they, they created it, but from the collection side of things, there's a return there and there's an assessment made based on that. And now that there's an assessment in the system, now you enter the collections process. The solution with, with these scenarios, you know, so the solution with substitute for returns is always file the real return. Uh, the IRS views these as an audit. So when you're filing the real return, it's technically an audit reconsideration. And, and there's a process for that, but I would make sure your tax preparer is accustomed to, to that process Otherwise, this gets lost in the system for another six months or so, and the IRS is collecting from you in the meantime. So there's a way to bridge that gap. Just make sure you're working with someone who, who is familiar with that, with that process. Do you have a question? Or no, you're, just, you're just scratching the, scratching no, the, the head there? Trying to retain it a little. No problem. So you're going to come into the collections process from one of these two options, right? You either filed a return showing that you owe money, or eventually the IRS got frustrated at you for not filing a return, and it did one for you, showing you owe probably a lot more money than you actually owe. Now you're in collections. So the IRS Collections Division is its own division within the IRS, and its entire purpose is to collect money. So these are debt collectors, uh, and that's, th that's the best way to think of them. Uh, these aren't typically uh, federal agents in the sense that they're carrying badges or guns, that this isn't the criminal division, these aren't auditors, these guys job is to collect money from you. And that's fantastic, I keep bungling the funds. But before they, before they are going to do that, they're going to assess penalties. And there's a couple primary penalties that you can count on uh, if by the time you're meeting a, a collections officer. And these guys are called revenue officers. We'll talk specifically about what they do in a minute. 
when you file a return late, uh, whether late is you know, two weeks late or late is 10 years late, filing a return late will trigger the failure to file penalty. This is why we always tell people, file the return. You know, if you owe money, still file the return, because what happens is the IRS adds 5% of your total balance per month until you cap out at 25%. So failing to file a return for six months, you've now increased by 25%, whatever the total balance is. And there's interest running on top of that. So if you're going to owe money, owe the least amount of money that you can. So there's a failure to file and then failure to pay. And these will run at the same time. So failure to pay runs at the rate of half a percent per month until it caps out at 25%. So if you're following along here, your tax bill is going to be at least 50% more than it would have been if you don't uh, pay and these things run through and, and max out. But half a percent per month is a way better penalty to, penalty to eat than the 5% per month. So if you're going to owe money, file the return so we cut off the failure to file penalty. Now you're just stuck with the failure to pay penalty. And the IRS throws in incentives here to try to trigger certain behavior. So for example, if you get into an installment agreement with the IRS, the rate at which the failure to pay penalty uh, moves forward is cut in half. So instead of increasing at half a percent per month, it's increasing at a quarter percent per month. It'll still cap out at 25%, but it takes a lot longer now to get to that point. So there's an incentive to get into an agreement where you're working something out. And typically, the IRS just wants to get paid. If I'm, and they make it relatively easy to do that, I would much rather you owe money to the IRS than to the state of Ohio. I would rather you owe money to just about anybody than to a municipality. Uh, and we can talk about why later. Uh, but the IRS makes this process relatively straightforward. The state hides the bottle a little bit. Any questions about this? There are other penalties out there. Uh, if you're audited, there's, there's uh, inevitably a 20% called accuracy-related penalty. We all hear it sometimes called the negligence penalty. It's sort of the, uh, the consolation prize for getting audited is on top of whatever they find that you underreported, you get dinged with 20% for, for having, uh, having had the luck of the draw to get, get an auditor looking at your books. The civil fraud penalty of 75% is something that everyone is, a, is actually usually thrilled to receive. Uh, I say that because this is rare. The only times I've seen the civil fraud penalty come into play are where we successfully talked the criminal guys into letting this just be a fine. Uh, so if they, <laughs> the, the proof, the standard of proof to prove a civil fraud penalty is high enough that you're in criminal territory. Uh, so this is something where hopefully none of you are having to deal with. Uh, if you are, you should talk to an attorney as soon as soon as possible. So following along on my, my uh, hypothetical taxpayer here who didn't file a return, you know, the IRS filed one for them and they get sent to the collections division. Most people will start off, th their, uh, their introduction to the collection system is the IRS ACS office, which is the automated collection system. When you get an IRS tax notice, in the upper right hand corner of that notice are a bunch of numbers and a bunch of gobbledygook that means something to ACS uh, and it talks about which template, letter template they're using and you can actually Google those and figure out you know, why am I here, what does this mean, what does the next step look like. Those uh, give us a lot of information on where you're at in the process and what, uh, what's coming down the, down the pike. But these get cranked out, you know, millions of these per year and they happen automatically. So if you see the, the letters ACS in the upper right, that means a person has not yet reviewed your account. You just fell into the, you, the uh, criteria by which the computer is now spitting out notices. The computer can spit out liens and levies. So the computer can take enforcement action against you. So many people find themselves with tax liens or garnishments that no human has ever actually handled that account. The computer is just spitting this out. This would happen in situations where the government knows you owe money, they know where you bank, uh, either because you've, you've tried paying them in the past, and then they routinely will record uh, the routing and account numbers of any checks they receive, 
uh, or you've had you know, an installment agreement set up with them where they're taking that, or they know from your bank because your bank is reporting its dividends or its interest. Whoops, wrong button. When your case is serious enough, which frequently in the income tax world means 100,000 or more, in payroll tax, it's a small, a far smaller threshold. So the quickest way to get the IRS's attention is to mess up withholding, or you know, mess up payroll, un federal unemployment, uh, anything related to the funds you're supposed to be holding back as an employer for your employees. That will get their attention at a far smaller level. Uh, but currently, most people can safely say they're going to not have to deal with an IRS revenue officer if, the in if it's only income tax debt, and we're talking about less than 100000 or so. Once it gets referred to a revenue officer, now you are a file on an employee in Cincinnati's office. So now there's an IRS employee who knows who you are and whose whole job is to resolve this debt. They know statistically that means most people aren't going to just say, oh yeah, here's a check, I'll just pay the whole thing, because most people would have done that by now uh, and avoided all of these fees and all these penalties. Uh, so notice I didn't say their job is to get you to pay the whole thing, their job is to get you to resolve the whole thing. And we'll talk about the, the distinction here because these are the tools you can use or have a tax advisor use on your behalf to you know, try to save money at, at this point. The revenue officers can and will issue liens and levies. If there aren't federal tax liens at this point, there will be soon. Uh, and we'll talk specifically about, about liens on the next slide. But the revenue officers are trained to make their first introduction in person. So these are the people that will show up at home or at the office, or you're going to come back to your house and see a, cr see a business card waiting for you on your doorstep, because that's what they're supposed to do. At that point, they're under the gun from their supervisors to make sure they come to some sort of resolution with this. And if they don't by talking to you, they will by starting to issue liens and levies, and they'll, they'll keep going until they get your attention that way. You have the absolute right to be represented. You can be represented by an attorney, you can be represented by a CPA registered with the IRS, or by what's called an enrolled agent, uh, which is basically a non-attorney, non-CPA tax advisor who takes this uh, admittedly complicated uh, test before the IRS, but now they're allowed to represent taxpayers. If you are represented by any of those individuals, there's a form they can file, and as soon as they file that, uh, this IRS power of attorney form, it's uh, Form 2848, if any of you are writing this down. As soon as they file Form 2848, the IRS has to work with them, not with you. Um, but uh, frequently, it's the revenue officer showing up that pushes people to, to you know, reach out and start looking for help here. These guys, again, are debt collectors. These aren't auditors, and these aren't the guys that are going in charge of criminal investigations. So if you see a revenue officer, that means your debt situation is serious, but that doesn't mean you know, the SWAT team is on its way to arrest you. That's, that's a different office. Yeah? At what point uh, in terms of uh, the dealing with a revenue officer, is the debt situation considered serious? If a revenue officer is involved, it's serious. Um, they, the computer frequently will make that decision of whether to kick it out or it's made at a managerial level. And each of the, the IRS campuses have a different, uh, different criteria for based on the number of, of returns coming in, based on factors we'll never know about on the internal policy side, uh, you know, what areas they're targeting. Were you targeted because of the profile of your particular business? Are there are certain industries that have a higher uh, higher risk profile than others that are more you know, cash intensive, for example, um, to where you know, th they're more concerned that there may be unreported funds out there. Uh, and some of this could be based on tips or on issues that we'll, we'll never know about, you'll never know about you know, going through your investigation, and I'd never find out about if I were representing you. Uh, the revenue officers, all they really know is this file has now appeared and now they, they have to do something with it. So from a, a practical perspective, if there's a revenue officer involved, you, have, you, well, you will come to a resolution of some sort by them either taking it from you or you entering into an agreement. Did that answer your question? So it's not based on an, an exact amount? Uh, there's not an exact amount. There's, there's not a magic line in the sand. It moves. Uh, I mean, if you owe $5,000, I am confident there will not be a revenue officer involved. If you owe 500, I'm confident there will be, and we can throw a dart in the meantime at, at where that line happens to be on any given day 
uh, in, in the middle there. But uh, payroll tax will grab them first. Uh, income tax, we've seen the IRS go after people who owe $4,000 and not touch the guy that owes two fifty. dollars and we've seen I mean, things that don't really matter or things that don't really make sense. Uh, if you ever figure out what that formula is, you'll make a lot of money. Uh, when you enter the collection cycle, you know, before anyone's going to come after you or anything bad's going to happen, the IRS is going to send you a series of five letters spaced approximately five weeks apart. You know, the first of these is typically a bill. So you file a tax return that showed you owed $1,000. They're going to send you a bill saying, we've received this return. Your liability is $1,000 plus, you know, here's your failure to pay penalty so far. Here's the interest so far. Uh, please send this by X amount of a date or there'll be more interest. Uh, so that's kind of your, your friendly notice. Then there's a slightly less friendly notice, then there's a serious notice, and then there's a we mean it notice, and then there's bad things is about to happen to you notice. There are more technical terms for that, but uh, ultimately that's what, it, that's what it boils down to. When you get to numbers four and number five, I put an asterisk by these because these letters trigger appeal rights. So when you've received these, number four and number five, you have the right to have your case reviewed by the IRS Office of Appeals. By law, the appeals office is a separate branch within the IRS that cannot have had any contact with your case so far. So frequently, if we're dealing with an IRS revenue officer in Cincinnati and we file an appeal, it could be someone in Florida, it could be Utah, it could be New York, it could be anywhere in the country that an appeals officer eventually reaches out to us to, to work through this. Some of the revenue officers refer to the appeals office as the candy shop. Thought being you'd get goodies out of them that you would never get out of the frontline you know, collection staff. And if you think about it, this, this makes sense. You know, if you are a rock star revenue officer, you're going to be the one that makes the most, you know, collects the most money from taxpayers because that's your job. You know, the best revenue officer in the office is going to be the guy that gets the most money out of people, right? I mean, we're, we're in the debt collection business here. If you're an appeals officer, the scenario is very different because the next step after the IRS appeals office is the U.S. tax court. If you are the appeals officer, the rock star appeals officer is the one who resolves the most cases, which may or may not mean collecting the most money, but resolves the most cases because they don't want to go to tax court any more than you do. because you know, They've got bigger fish to fry. They don't want to come after uh, my client who owes four thousand dollars when there's you know a corporation that owes four million dollars uh, tax courts a waste of resources for lots of people so uh, the appeals office exists because if they don't put a break the brakes on this case could end up in tax court now it's more expensive for everybody so the appeals office has a lot of authority to to make some um, to issue relief you know, they can release the levy they can release the liens uh, they can negotiate deals you know, frequently if we're dealing with negotiations, the negotiations get resolved at the appeals level. Uh, so appealing is a very common strategy. It's also very much set by statute. If you blow the appeals deadline, you're suddenly in, in trouble because no one really has the authority to extend it. There's a uh, permissive appeals program. It's called the um, Collection Appeals Program as opposed to the Collection Due Process Program, which is or Due Process Appeal, which is the regular appeals process. The uh, permissive one, the IRS could change its mind next week and change the regulations, and that's no longer an option. They, uh, they currently encourage these sort of programs, they encourage compliance with it, but uh, you can't go to tax court at the end of that process. So we've lost some leverage there from a negotiation perspective. But frequently, by the time a client contacts us, you know, they've, they've, we're past that deadline, and that may be our, our only option out there, so we'll, we'll use it. Does this make sense so far? As you're looking at the upper right corner of that IRS notice, if any of you have started to receive these, these goodies from the feds, if it says LT11, so letter 11, or CP1058, CP is computer paragraph, that's just named for their templates. What's that second one? CP1058. Those are two of the codes for letter number five. If you see either of those, that means something bad is going to happen to you if you don't respond to this. 
you know, the IRS, like every federal agency, is backed up. So that doesn't mean if they say you have to respond by March 1st and you don't respond by March 1st, that doesn't mean the lien is coming out March 2nd. It could come out March 2nd. Mm -hmm. um, realistically, they usually give you a week for things to pass in the mail. Um, but you're, you're now in the danger zone because they're allowed to do something bad to you. So you're, you're on the, you know, there's a bullseye on you at that point. That, that wasn't if we get there beforehand. Number four goes by a number of different names, but number four, the threat is if you don't act, we are going to seize your state tax refund. And, and they can, so that they can offset your state tax refund to pay the federal tax debt. Uh, the way they phrase that is, makes it sound like they're going after other property. We can se seize your personal property, such as your state tax refund. Number five is, we can seize your, <laughs> seize your property. So five is the, the serious one, four is to get your attention, but they both come with appeals rights. So do that sooner rather than, rather than later. Any questions about that? So I've mentioned federal tax liens are, are out there as a tool that they can use to collect from you. So let's talk for a second about what these actually are, because there's a lot of, lot of myths around what a federal tax lien is and what it's not, and you know, if I don't have a house, does that even matter? And it does, and here's, here's why. Anytime you owe taxes to the government, there's what's called a, a secret lien. Uh, you know, generally, uh, there's an attorney in the back row here who can talk extensively about this. Generally, there has to be a judgment or a lien of some sort for a creditor to collect upon a debt. So by law, poof, there's a lien if you owe money to the IRS. That's purely between you and the IRS. So all that really means is they're allowed to collect from you. For them to have a place in line with your property, you know, as opposed to your mortgage company or, or someone you're refinancing with or uh, you know, a car lender or, or any sort of other financial institution, to secure that place in line, they have to file this lien. When they file the lien, they're going to file it in Ohio with the county recorder, like any other person ho holding a lien on property. The big difference here, though, is federal tax liens attach to people, not to properties. So if you own property, it attaches to that, too. If the lien's filed today and tomorrow, you inherit property, it attaches to that, too. This is what makes it different from a lien any other regular creditor could get on you, is it attaches not only the property you own when you file it, it attaches to property you, owe, you acquire until the lien is taken care of. So this is a powerful collections tool. The state doesn't have this level of authority. Uh, only the IRS can, uh, get, can do this here. Uh, state tax liens will attach to property, not people also, but they attach to whatever property the person had when the lien is filed. They, they don't uh, automatically roll forward like the, like the federal liens do. Do they move from state to state? Well, each state is going to honor another state's tax lien. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, federal tax liens, you mean? Uh, yeah, federal tax liens will follow you wherever you go. What about the state? The state tax lien will follow you also, but remember, state liens cover whatever property you owned when they file it. Okay. So if, you, if, they f if Ohio files a tax lien against you right now and you move to Kentucky and you acquire money to buy a new house, that lien doesn't automatically attach there. It may have attached to the money you used to buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it were a federal tax lien, yeah, it's going to follow you. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the danger of uh, federal tax liens. So when people say, you know, they filed a lien against me, but I, I don't own any property, well, that's not true. You absolutely do own property. I mean, you've got, uh, you may not own real estate, but you, you, know, you may have a bank account. You probably have a bank account. You've got retirement accounts. Uh, you know, you've got Social Security income eventually. You've got, uh, you know, a car. You've got, you know, a couch. Uh, property, we tend to think of liens in the terms of real estate because most of the liens we deal with are either mortgage liens or mechanics liens or something involving that piece of real estate. Tax liens are far, far broader. And they're public. So uh, this can affect credit ratings. This can affect ability to get a loan. Uh, if you Google that, so to walk back that statement a few months, last July, uh, the credit bureaus announced that they're not going to report tax liens as a matter of, of course on credit reports. I promise you, any bank you go to is still going to know if you have federal tax liens or not. It just means they're getting that information from LexisNexis instead of Equifax. They're still getting the information. So whether it affects your FICO score or not, it's still, as a practical matter, affecting your ability to obtain credit. And that makes sense. So if you think about 
about a credit score as what are the, you know, as kind of a mathematical representation of what are the odds that you're going to pay me back if I loan you money. If I'm second in line behind the IRS that has armed agents, they're going to get money out of you before I am. So your credit score is going to be lower as a result, right? That's just a practical, practical reality. So frequently, we encounter these issues when someone goes to sell a house, uh, or they're going to go re refinance something, and all of a sudden, it's the title company that discovers there's a federal tax lien out there. So the tax code requires the IRS to send you notice. It doesn't require you to receive notice. So we see this particularly with people who haven't filed returns in a long time. You know, the way the IRS generally keeps track of where you live is you're reporting that to them every year on your 1040. If you haven't filed a 1040 in 10 years, they're sending notices to wherever they are last aware of, uh, which may or may not be anywhere near where you're living, living now. But their duty is covered as long as they sent the notice to the last address they had. So we see this all the time where someone's getting, uh, get, getting a collection from uh, taxes that they, they believe they've never received notice from. Does this make sense so far? So the, so the lien, tax lien will follow the normal lien rules. Uh, you know, it'll expire when a normal lien expires unless the IRS extends it. And on the face of the lien itself, it will tell you what tax years it applies to, what type of tax is involved, and when the last day is that the IRS could refile this lien to renew it if the lien's about to expire. One difference between tax liens and other liens, between federal tax liens and other liens, is that uh, as a matter of federal tax law, not as a matter of property law, bankruptcy law, or other areas, but as a matter of federal tax law, the IRS isn't allowed to have an uncollectible lien out there. So if the tax has been discharged in bankruptcy, or if the statute of limitations has expired, the lien as a matter of law comes off. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, there's a process to formally do that if, if uh, they don't do it on their own. Liens in themselves are an annoyance, but what they really are as a practical matter is a springboard to levies. Levies is where the IRS actually collects money from you. The IRS will do this by sending out bank levies as the most common form. You know, if they know that you bank at Fifth Third, they will send Fifth Third a letter saying this person with this social security number owes $50,000 and you have to pay it over to us. What will happen at that point is you know, the bank will process it and whatever you happen to have in your accounts up to that amount on the day that you file, or on the day that the bank receives this, the bank is required to hold for 21 days to give you time to sort this out with the IRS. If after that time you haven't resolved it yet, they are required to mail that amount to, to the Treasury. If the day after the bank receives this notice, you get a major deposit, you know, your paycheck comes in, a customer pays you, you know, benefits hit, whatever, that's separate. So this isn't an ongoing bank levy. A bank levy is a snapshot of the day the bank happens to process that thing. Money comes in the next day, it's still yours. But you'll know that you're on the list now. I mean, if the IRS collects, if the bank ends up sending the Treasury funds based on that, you know, there's a checkbox next to that account number, they're going to you know, hit that again. Wage garnishments are sort of the next easy grab because someone is reporting, you know, your employer is reporting uh, on their end your payroll. You know, W-2s are coming out, quarterly income, or quarterly payroll tax filings are being filed. Uh, pr presumably. Wage garnishments are continuing garnishments. So if the bank levy for 50000 only nets two grand, that's great. The IRS could turn around and go back and, and will eventually. But if the wage garnishment from you only gives them 200 bucks, that garnishment is in place until you've paid the thing in full or until the IRS releases it. So those continue. It gets a little more complicated if you're an independent contractor, and we, we can talk about that. If you're in business for yourself, the IRS can send garnishments to your accounts receivable, uh, where they'll send you know, actually to your customers saying, I see that you owe the business $1,000 for whatever, you know, for services you provided but haven't paid for yet. Don't pay you, pay the treasury. You know, send that check to the treasury. So those can be devastating on a cash flow basis. And you, you may wonder how the IRS would know what your receivables are, and that's always part of the game. What they've started doing in the past couple of years is going after merchant processors. 
So they'll see who is actually processing the credit cards that your company is accepting. So if you're set up with Fifth Third or with you know, Chase or whomever else is handling your credit card processing, and they know that every month you're getting a bill or you're getting payment from some guy out there, they'll send the letter to that guy out there and they'll send the letter to the credit card processor. So they're gonna bolt down all of these different areas. I have a revenue officer who was very excited to tell me that he found a fantastic way to collect from attorneys. Uh, uh, he started uh, looking up uh, on the court records which cases that attorney is on and sending bills out to the clients. And he said in that case, that got the guy's attention really quick. Uh, so th these guys are, are creative and they have access to all sorts of information that we don't have access to, largely. Uh, you know, they'll contact utility companies. They'll, they, they've got some real tools to, to figure these things out and the authority to collect on them. The IRS is the only institution that can go after qualified retirement accounts. They can go after Social Security benefits. Regular creditors can't. The IRS can take 15% of monthly Social Security income. Yeah. Where do they get stocks? I'm sorry? Where do they get stocks? Oh, absolutely, they'll take stocks. Yeah, those are, those are an easy grab uh, because the stock, you know, the brokerage house is sending you uh, dividend statements. So those are, that's an easy way for them to figure out what do you own, where do you own it, uh, and then they'll actually send out a summons to the bank or to the brokerage saying which accounts does he have, uh, you know, how long has he had them, whose names are they in, uh, and they'll go after it that way. They can go after real estate, they can go after, uh, I've heard plenty of stories, and going after cars, uh, you know, they'll take the boat. They, they have an impressive amount of collections tools available to them if they get to this point <coughs> in the process. Uh, our job usually is to interrupt this collection cycle by offering some sort of resolution, which they would much rather have than they really don't want to be in the real estate or used car business. Um, but they'll do that if that's their only, their only option. So we've talked about how to get into tax trouble, how the IRS finds out you're in tax trouble, what happens when you are introduced to the collections division. Now let's talk about the common tools for fixing it. I'm going to begin this with a warning. If you listen to late night television or to the radio, you're gonna get, you're gonna hear all sorts of fantastic claims about we can settle your debt for pennies on the dollar. Or, you know, I owed $80,000 and I settled it for two grand. Okay, that's fantastic. I promise you those guys are better marketers than they are at tax work. I'm not legally allowed to make promises like that. Uh, the legal ethics rules don't allow an attorney to say things like that. So you're not dealing with an attorney by, by definition here. And you're going to find that nine out of 10 times, these are coming from Florida, Colorado, California, Oregon, or some other state with lower uh, consumer protection laws than what Ohio provides. Because if I screw someone over, they're gonna come to my office and talk to me about it. Are you gonna really fly to Florida for the purpose when you can't afford your tax, pay taxes to have it out with some Florida company or hire an attorney down there to go after it? And you'd be impressed at how often these companies turn over and just reappear later with a different name. So I don't want them to go away completely because we make a lot of money fixing these problems. But, uh, and I like that they raise awareness, but I want to sort of emphasize that resolving tax debt isn't like buying a used car. The IRS doesn't say, you, know, you owe 80, so I'm gonna offer you 30 and we meet in the middle at 50. Everything's very formulaic and driven by what could they actually collect from you. So to, to work with a client to actually pay back less, we have to show that that's all the IRS could possibly suck out of this guy is you know, 20 grand instead of 80 grand. We have had pennies on the dollar settlements, but that takes a really unique set of facts. We had, a, we had a business owner who racked up almost a million dollars of tax debt back in 2000 and has been disabled for the past few years and only has Social Security. So guess what? That technically was mathematically a dollar pennies on the dollar settlement, but that's a really unusual circumstance that had n nothing to do with my skill as an attorney that had purely to do with his situation in life. So we're not haggling with the IRS, uh, but there is a process to, to resolve this. So let's touch on the, uh, <laughs> that's cute. There's four main tools that we use to resolve tax debt. Not everyone will uh, qualify for all of these. In fact, most of the time, you're only gonna qualify for one or two of these. What the IRS always wants to do is they, they always want you to pay this whole thing back and they're willing to let you do that over time. 
so the IRS, you'll, you'll hear, uh, actually it's the pennies on the dollar advertisements really that talk a lot about what they call the Fresh Start Initiative. The Fresh Start Initiative is from 2014 and was the name of the, public, of the press release that the Treasury put out you know, this expanded opportunities for installment agreements. So this isn't some new thing that came along. This has been, this has been out there, just a new way of packaging some of the tools that have always been around. But they did broaden the uh, number of people that qualify for these. So here's the deal with installment agreements. Typically, the IRS will allow you to stretch out what you owe over a six-year period or over uh, the remainder of the 10-year statute of limitations if that's less than six years. So when you file a return, and notice I'm saying when you file a return, when you file a return, the IRS has 10 years to collect on that. If they don't, you know, 10 years and a day later, it is forever uncollectible if we're talking about income tax. Other taxes have much larger, or m much different rules. F far different rules. I can at least use proper grammar since the camera's running, right? So you file a return, a 10 year clock starts. If in year eight, you want to do an installment agreement, the IRS will let you, but they're not going to, I mean, they've got the timer running here. They're not gonna let you extend that unless you waive the statute of limitations and there's a process to do that too. That is called a streamlined installment agreement. If you have less than $50,000 of tax debt, you're generally entitled to a streamlined installment agreement if we're talking about income tax debt. So you can stretch that out over up to six years and you can do so without having to provide detailed financials to the government. And that's key. So when you end up sending the government financials, they now know where to stick you if you don't pay them. Uh, so I, as a practical level, I don't like having my clients give any more information to the government than they, they absolutely have to. If you owe less than $10,000, you can do all of this online. Actually, if you owe less than 25,000, you can do the installment agreement online and you don't need me to help you with that. If it's 10,000 or less, the IRS is required by law to give it to you. There's no discretion on their part. If you owe up to 25, you can still do this online and the IRS will let you send in a check each month if you want to, or uh, the fee to do this is slightly less if you'll allow them to take it directly from your bank accounts, knowing though that now they're recording your, your bank account information. If you owe more than 25, but less than 50, you can still do this. You have to pay by direct debit but they won't file a tax lien if one hasn't been filed yet. If you owe between 50 and 100,000, they will file a federal tax lien, but you can still stretch this out over up to six years, so long as you're paying by direct debit. If you owe more than 100, you're no longer eligible for a streamlined installment plan, and what you end up having to do is provide detailed financials, and the IRS will determine for you, because they're nice like that, how much they believe you can pay each month towards this, towards this tax debt. So if a client walks in owing 120,000, my goal is how do we pay off that 20 to get you, you know, to 100,000 or less, because now I don't have to provide all of the information we have to provide otherwise. Does that part make sense so far? And remember, by getting into the installment agreement, we've doubled the amount of, t or we've cut in half the amount of, uh, the rate of increase on that failure to pay penalty. But interest is still interest is still running. You're always allowed to pay it off early, uh, but usually the reason you're not paying it off early is because you don't have the money to do that. Currently not collectible status is an option out there if we produce financials showing that you literally can't afford to make a payment. If you can pay at least $50 a month, the IRS wants you to be in an, in an installment agreement of some sort. There's a process by which we tell the IRS, okay, you can pay $100 a month, but that's it, and you owe you know, $100,000, so you're never, ever, ever going to pay that off. And so there's a process to get them to accept what you can afford to pay, but now we have to produce all sorts of financials showing that that's actually the case. They're not gonna take our, our word for it. Currently not collectible status is a Band-Aid. So if you owe tax dollars, but you're unemployed, you know, the reason you didn't pay that tax bill is because you lost your job and you don't have any money coming in. There's a process to have you declared what the IRS calls currently not collectible. Penalties and interest continue to build up. So this is a temporary fix, but the IRS is gonna back off. 
and typically they'll check in at least once a year uh, or they will kick you out of this status if they receive a payroll tax return, a W-2 or a 1099 showing that someone is paying you money. So they'll find out if you have a job because your employer is going to send them a W-2 and now you're back in the collections cycle with all of the penalties and interest that have built up to that point. So this really is a band-aid. You know, unless someone is, is permanently disabled or we know that they're never coming back to this, this, um, this is a quick fix, but uh, you sh this doesn't ultimately resolve the tax debt. And then the two sort of sledgehammer approaches we have to resolving income tax debt are the offer and compromise, which is the process everyone's talking about with the penalties on the dollar, or paying pennies on the dollar part. So here's the deal with the offer and compromise. Like I said, we're not haggling. What we're doing is ultimately playing a make-believe game with the IRS. So we pretend like we sell your real estate. We pretend like we cash out all your accounts. We pretend like we sell your car, we sell all your earthly belongings, and then we take 12 months of your spare income, because I'm sure you feel like you have a lot of spare income. Spare income in IRS terms is what you actually make, minus what they believe people in our part of the country ought to spend on food, housing, transportation, medicals, etc. And I would love to see Treasury staff have to live within these budgets. They uh, basically treat us like we all ought to, you know, uh, eat twigs and berries for the for the most part. Uh, the numbers just aren't aren't terribly realistic in a lot of ways. So uh, our job obviously is to get that gap as small as we can. But what we do is you take that gap and you throw 12 months of it into this imaginary pot. And then the offer and compromise process is a process whereby we tell the IRS, all right, if you went after this guy with all you had, all you could possibly squeeze out of him in the next 12 months is this amount we're going to pay you that and call it even. That's what the offer and compromise process is. This process takes forever. This is not a quick resolution. Nothing happens quickly with the IRS. And so there's a lot of nuance in here. So of course, if I had to sell your house tomorrow, I'm not going to get as much for it as you would if you had you know, six months to stage this, right? If we had to cash out your retirement account, you know, there's penalties and everything else on that. So there's all sorts of deductions we take here. And there's certain things the IRS won't touch. You know, they're not going to take away money you would need to buy prescriptions. They're not going to you know, prevent you from having health insurance, you know, that sort of thing. You get more credit if there's other people you're supporting. So there's a lot of, a lot of nuance in this, in this formula. Um, but the process takes a very long time. It was taking so long that Congress actually amended the tax code to say that if the IRS hasn't said yes or no in two years, the answer is yes. Now, there's nothing that keeps them from <laughs> waiting 23 months and rejecting it. Uh, in practice, I've never had one take that long. Uh, it is sort of unheard of, at least from my experience, to have these be resolved in less than six months. So what usually happens is you send in this whole packet of stuff. Because if we say you're spending $100 a month on you know, Duke Energy, they want six months of Duke bills. Uh, so typically, an offer and compromise process has you know, 80 pages plus of, of supporting documents. We mail it off to Treasury, and then we just kind of wait. Uh, within 30 to 60 days, we'll get a letter saying, thanks, we've received this, and we'll process it. And then there is nobody to talk to, no one to check in with, until this eventually gets assigned to an examiner in Holtzville, New York. It's where every case on, from Ohio and you know, most of the, the eastern United States gets sent to. So eventually, six months later, it ends up on someone's desk up in Holtzville, New York. Now they're opening this file for the first time, even though we filed it you know, at least six months ago. And suddenly, they want updated pay subs, updated bank statements. You know, there's a flurry of activity. Uh, they crunch the numbers on their end and apply issues that we will never know about. You know, where is our office in terms of collections? You know, President and Congress are fighting over things. Is that good for us or bad for us? I mean, there's, there's political considerations we not only have no idea of, we will never know about. So it is possible to do our job 100% perfectly and then still say no. This is discretionary. The only appeal we are allowed to make to a, to a saying of no is that they didn't follow their own rules. So as long as they follow their own procedural rules, there's no there's no review at the end. The only review is, did the IRS follow their rules? And their rules are very permissive, as you can, as you can imagine. So eventually, we get that, that answer. And they have to explain why if they're going to say no. So they'll 
they'll send spreadsheets back and we get to point out you forgot this exemption or that exemption or here's more stuff. So there's some back and forth, but most of these, fr from my experience anyway, are resolved somewhere around the nine to 12 month mark. In the meantime though, they have to put all of your accounts on hold. So you're, you're paused in the collections process. You know, no more levies, they can file federal tax liens and they will. So if they haven't filed a lien yet, they will file it to protect their interest. Is that what? Interest that's accumulating, does that go on hold? Nope, but if the offer is granted, it gets wrapped up in the offer amount. Um, so the IRS typically doesn't have the authority even to remove interest. Uh, interest is set by Congress. Penalties are sometimes discretionary under certain circumstances with the IRS. There's a process where the IRS has the ability to waive penalties if they choose to. Uh, uh, and then the final, final sort of tool we have here, oh, I'm sorry, with the offer and compromise, if they say yes. So that's a cause for celebration. Great, they said yes. We now have four months to pay them what remains in this pot. Uh, and there's a process to extend that even. Once that's paid, yay, all your tax debt up to that point, including the interest you've accumulated since the time we filed that, uh, are settled for the amount of the pot but you are on tax probation for five years. Every return has to be filed on time. If your 1040 shows that you owe money, you have to pay that by April 15th. You can extend your, uh, your filing date until October 15th, but if you owe money, you have to pay it back in April. And if you blow any of those deadlines, all that tax debt comes back with penalties and interest. So it's a, um, it's a risky proposal, but potentially a very, very profitable one in that there's few tools that we have that are as powerful as the offer and compromise. The only one that comes close to that is bankruptcy. Most people think you can't file bankruptcy on tax debt, and that's simply not true. If you fall into these three criteria, I know we're running up against I'm a little over my time here, but if you hit these three issues, you can discharge income tax in bankruptcy. So income tax again, not sales tax, not payroll tax, but income tax. If the tax year was at least three years ago, and we go by the day the return was due, so you know, 2017 is not due until 2018, so 18, 19, 20, 21, there we go. I'm doing lawyer math here. This is why I'm not the accountant. <laughs> uh, so three years from when that return is due, great. If that return has been filed for at least two years. So you have to have filed a return and it has to have been on file for two years. If you never file 2008, you can never discharge 2008 because that's not, that's not in the system yet. If you file 2008 today, we have to wait two years for that to become eligible. But if the IRS filed one for you, if they filed an SFR under current law, that forever blocks bankruptcy. Uh, there's a circuit split on this, and the Supreme Court has dodged four attempts in the past three years to grant a uh, review of this issue. At some point, they will have to do that. But um, that's a gray area. It's not great for our circuit. For our circuit, if there's a substitute for return, that year can never be, be discharged in bankruptcy. So three years ago, the return's been on file for three years, and the tax bill is not coming from an audit from the past nine months. If you fit those three criteria, that tax debt is just like a credit card for bankruptcy purposes. I like using the bankruptcy process for tax debt when appropriate, because it's the only tool here where I don't have to say pretty please to the IRS. You know, a judge will apply the law in the way that the law is set up, and that's, uh, that, that can be a great tool under the right circumstances. But all of these require that the returns be filed. The IRS won't deal with us in any manner uh, if there's unfiled returns out there. So usually that is the first answer. If there's unfiled returns, get something filed so that we, it opens the door to the rest of these tools. Even if it's late? Even if it's late, get something out there. Because uh, you know, their approach is if you aren't doing your part, why should they, why should they help you? Right. Plus, for all they know, you're not filing because of that million dollar jackpot you just won, <laughs> which is obviously not the case, but that's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know how much to actually assess. So they want to make sure their numbers are right. And frequently, if they've done a return for you, you should file a return because you're going to owe less. If they've owed you money from the past three years and you file the return, 
for the past three years, they will still pay you that or, or apply it towards what you owe. The problem comes where if you owed money from 2005, uh, but you never filed 2005, that's longer than three years ago. See, even lawyer math tells me that. Uh, so they may offset what you owe for that year, but they won't give you a check for it. I'm not going to ask if that makes a sense, because this doesn't have to make sense. I just more want to make sure you understand what the rules currently are. You uh, can't come up with a system as bizarre as our tax system if you tried. All of you are going to have some sort of tax issue at some point in life. So you know, the, the standard response is you know, make sure you're filing your returns. Don't panic. They're probably not sending the SWAT team after you. you know, frequently we get the, am I going to jail because I filed my return late? And uh, no, pr probably not. Uh, and talk to a tax professional if you, if you need help with any of this. Uh, I'm out of time to talk about how to find a good tax professional. But if you have any questions, I'll leave my information here, even with the blurry fonts. Uh, if I can do anything to answer any of your questions or you have specific questions for me, I'll hang around afterwards. Vanessa, thank you for the help and for the law library and the lawyer referral service uh, inviting me to come give this. The Cincinnati Bar Association's Lawyers Referral Service is a fantastic resource if you need legal help. Thank you.